Hello, and welcome back to the SuperCloud live in studio performance here at Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante and team. This focus of SuperCloud 4 is on generative AI, our fourth installment, and our next guest could not make it in the studio live, so we decided to bring him in remote. Brian Harris, the executive vice president and CTO of SAS Cube alumni, just had their event. The Cube was at. Uh, Brian, great to see you. And by the way, um, congratulations on a great cha SAS championship, uh, pro am, and then pro tournament. You guys were involved in. Congratulations on that great event. Great tie-in, golf and tech go to great together. Great to see you. Same here, John. Thanks for having me on here. I, I, it's been an, it was an incredible event. It was actually great to have you out there and. Uh, you know, he did a couple amazing shots out there. I saw firsthand, so yeah. great job. And what what an, an incredible experience to play with some of the pros like Patrick Harrington and and Justin Leonard. I mean, just amazing. So it's uh, so we're coming off that high and getting back to business to have a strong Q4. Awesome. We'd love to watch those pro athletes, but you know, the Cube's all about tech athletes. Great to have <laughs> you on. You're um, CTO, EVP SaaS, going through a major transformation, huge install based customers, storied history, um, private company, well, great culture. We talked about that a lot at your event. Generative AI is up is upending the industry. It's changing the landscape in real time. The hype is out there. The reality is matching the hype. You're in the middle of it. You're re-architecting the solutions in real time, which actually means that's going to be an addition to the existing solutions. Not a lot of rip and replace and take kill the old to bring in. There's going to be a lot of both going to add on top of it. So I want to get your thoughts. As cloud goes next level, how do you see organizations deploying generative AI? What are some of the low hanging fruit use cases? What are they looking at? Clearly experimentation is there. Production, we're seeing not many conversations there yet, but how do you see organizations deploying Gen AI? Well, let me, uh, let me put it into a kind of a technology bucket and then kind of the business sides. First, from a technology perspective, we believe this is a feature, not a product, meaning that you've got to integrate generative AI throughout a much more robust um, AI platform because at the end of the day, when a generative AI prompt gives you a response, you need to back it up with facts and uh, supporting data, especially if, it, if an answer is not intuitive. So you need to have the entire lineage of, of an answer if you, you know, if it's not an obvious answer that's being provided back from the generative AI experience. So I think it's important to know because uh, that's why we think as a, as a company that's been doing this for really longer than most in the market, uh, we believe we can uh, add this on in a very natural way to our entire product portfolio uh, to extend generative AI to real use cases and industry solutions for our customers. So we're very excited about that. Um, I think, and then let's take it from the business side of the house. So we just see generative AI actually really playing a big part of this uh, simulation and digital twin experience that we're going to see in the market coming over the next five years, which is, you know, the, the disruption in the world seems like every single year we have incredible disruptions we're all navigating as businesses. And really what a C-level, board level, everyone wants to know is what, I want to ask what if questions and get answers quickly about how do I react? How do I position the business? How do I build resiliency into the business? And enabling people to ask natural human questions about the business against data and systems. This is really, to me, a huge uh, game-changing capability that allows businesses to just get access to answers faster. So we think that that simulation and digital twin of that, you're going to sit there and interact, ask questions of your business. And based on that question, you're going to see systems be orchestrated behind the scenes to really answer those questions for you. And which is going to reduce barriers to entry on interactions with data in the company, like we've, unlike we've ever seen before in the industry. And what's great too, some of the use cases out there around objective databases showing that you can actually do things differently. Um, and I was talking to a startup that was doing that and they're just now getting to the distributed nature of it. So you have the whole yeah. startup open source community kind of growing into it fast from a new perspective. Again, it's generational. Then you have existing businesses that you guys are a lot, have a lot of presence yeah. in and have been doing a lot of um, AI over the years. And you made a comment at your Explore event I want to get um, your reaction to now. I asked you a question, I said, what industries have the most uptake or affinity towards um, um, generative AI? You said it'll ha impact all industries, but you made a comment I thought was interesting, I want to get your thoughts on again. You said the regulated ones actually are set up for this. Yes. And, and I asked why, you said, because there's not a lot of ambiguity. What do you mean by that? And, and explain that, what that means. I think this is a really important point. I think you got to follow. I mean, you're going to see. Uh, I mean, I think that the, the support industries are are obviously low hanging fruit, right? Wherever you have now, I'll talk about knowledge bases in a minute. But where there's regulatory pressure, there's incentives for compliance, which means you want if you're in an investigative doing fraud, or if you're in regulatory for banking and you got to deal with risk, 
what you really want to do is that when the auditors come through, you want to have uh, you want to ensure that you have compliance to the way you're processing data and making decisions about the business for customers, right? And so what a lot of these organizations have are policies on how you're supposed to do that. And so the first thing you can think about is how can you bring in this augmented intelligence into workflows that allows a fraud um, analyst, you know, fraud uh, um, leader to basically ensure that their staff is executing their investigations in a consistent way or a let's say police investigation is investigating in a consistent way according to the processes and and regulations that they're being asked to uh, adopt and adhere to. And so immediately knowledge bases that are already there, they're in either Word documents, PDFs, or maybe even in databases or content management systems, these become the vernacular, right, for, you, I think you mentioned before, you know, small language models that we can bring into generative AI workflows that, that really ensure that, okay, um, I, I can actually get tasks recommended to me uh, on what's my next what's my next best action within a regulated business and that next best action is really aligned to the compliance of what your business has to adhere to and and you saw actually some of this we demoed this actually at SAS Explorer with one of the uh, with visual investigator and how we allow police officers or even uh, investigators to kind of see how to take an investigation that was driven by a generative AI workflow that's where I'm coming from when I say there's regulated industries. There's a built-in compliance function that allows that to be used as knowledge management to drive workflows that are more consistent and uh, defendable to a regulator. The next question I want to ask you is which areas do you see in the next few years that have the greatest impact for business? But I want to couch it with um, what we saw at the pandemic with cloud, right? When, when the yeah. pandemic hit, if you were in the cloud, you had a tailwind during the yes. pandemic. If you didn't, you were catching up and maybe were flat-footed. With AI, we're seeing that um, you can do AI wrapper apps, no problem, and AI native and other stuff. But if you're in data and you're doing data right, labeling, doing the investment on compliance and um, data management, you're kind of positioned well for AI. Yes. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, hundred percent. I actually look at it as a as almost like a pyramid of pressure coming down. That's why I use it. Like, so if you think about this idea, what I was mentioning around uh, synthetic twins and simulation, right? Like, I, look, if I have a problem in the business and suddenly I want to understand like what happens if the supply of natural gas increases by eight percent, the question I would ask is, well, what is the impact of my business? That's really the high level question that a C level person or even you know VP or even further down in the organization people would want to ask. The question today, that is like a, you know, a very complicated probably answer that has to go through the entire organization. In the future, that may feel like a generative AI experience through a, a chat session that is orchestrating a ton of work behind the scenes that is seamlessly rendered back as a response from generative AI. What does that mean? Well, to produce that outcome, there needs to be these specialized use cases that understands the vernacular of that industry. So we got to look at the industry use cases, constrain the, the language that's being used to have those conversations in that industry. And then, and then we need to you, then we need to say, okay, well then what are the knowledge bases that are used to actually have that conversation, right? So what are the, the natural knowledge bases that organizations have been using for the years, over the years to actually, um, you know, uh, capture what is important in the organization and what are the facts and answers and finished, um, uh, in the intelligence world, finished intel, what's the finished documents that are used to communicate through the business. Now, to do that well though, you have to have great data management. So that's why I believe there's a thesis out here that says that generative AI is going to incentivize uh, a, a whole resurgence in data management because you cannot have a solid generative AI experience without incredibly good data management capabilities underneath the hood. You don't want to restrict the data, you want to have it built in from day one with the right policies and compliance built in and let it grow. Correct. Let it, let it grow. Yeah, and, so, and think about today, how many organizations have knowledge scattered throughout the organization that if they could put it in the right tech stack could benefit from generative AI experiences. So that's where I'm saying is there's such huge, there's a huge opportunity to go in and really incentivize that work to incredibly huge returns in the uh, executive experience in the organizations that they're, they're doing that work in. In decision, that brings up the next kind of thread, which is customers preparing for this next wave, their workforce capabilities. You know, enterprise, you mentioned, you know, data everywhere scattered. It reminds me of the old data problem of enterprise search. If you look, yeah. at, if you look at all the successes today with large language models, the proprietary, whether it's OpenAI or Anthropic and others, search is chatbots, co-pilot and search are big impacts. So 
it yeah. seems to be with vector databases and other technologies where you have embeddings and this new kind of capabilities with data stores, they're sitting next to each other. They're changing the retrieval aspect of data. Mm -hmm. This is becoming much more of an open data model. You're seeing open source with Parquet and Iceberg, is yep. data warehouses change, democratization of data warehouses. This is a technical change. So the next question of how customers are preparing their workforce to take advantage of generative AI capabilities is an interesting one because it's up and down the stack. It's not just the workers, it's under the hood, it's IT, it's oh, yeah. how you buy, which chips you buy, uh, how you organize your data, how your APIs are constructed, what's your security posture, all these things are impacted. How do customers prepare for this? Well, I think that um, I'm always a believer in starting with, first of all, there's probably a couple dimensions to this question because one is, um, what are the business questions you're looking to seek you know, more efficient answers from? And you got to start there and go backwards, right? We have saw all the failed uh, data lakes, right? Strategies where people just put data into a pile, into an IT a data lake, and then they wonder why they can't get value out of it. You know, I said, it's like putting all your data up in a, you know, in, in your home, you don't put everything up in the attic and go look for it, right? It's like you organize your house according to your access patterns to how you're functioning in the house. Enterprises need to do the same thing. They need to start about with first and foremost, what are the key questions they're looking to answer at any given time throughout their business and then work backwards and let the tech stack be derived from those questions. And that ultimately then becomes optimizations. And really what I'd look at is, is generative AI it's a, the generative AI aspect of this takes this impedance mismatch that we saw for years in um, UIs and interfaces that we have to build to communicate back that answer to an exec or anyone else who's a decision maker. It now becomes this human language experience. And so start with those questions first that you're trying to answer and let that drive that down the organization. Um, but we also need to make sure that we up the game on the responsibility of these capabilities in the organization. So, we, you know, you've heard us talk about responsible innovation as a big topic at SAS. And it's because, um, you know, there is there are risks to this technology. I mean, it's not, it, there, there can be errors with it if you don't treat it with care. So we focused a lot on understanding first, do you understand the technology? So training the workforce of understanding at a high level, what is this technology doing? And if you understand that, then you understand where the risks are. And we want to make sure that the organizations, we, that the, our people are conversed, even people outside of the tech part of the organization, they understand where, at, you know, at a high level, how the technology is used, where are the risks so that everyone can, if there's, everyone can identify when a risk is emerging and, and, and escalate that if needed. It's really, really important because the, the, the part of the generative AI story that is not always told is that you can scale bad information quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. So it's really important that we uplift the, uh, the, the, the knowledge in the organization about this technology across all functional units in the business. Dave Vellante loves when I bring up guardrails. Actually, I, I don't actually like that term personally, but I like to bring it up. Here it's important because you yeah. mentioned governance. What guardrails yeah. and governance principles our company's putting in place to ensure responsibility, use of the data and AI specifically? Because that's a good point. I mean, people, they want to let it go and run a little bit, understand it. Yeah. You don't want to constrain it to the point where it's not innovative. At the same time, you don't want it to go off the rails, so to speak. So what are the guardrails you see in, in governance principles that companies yeah. can put in place to ensure the well, responsible AI? Well, obviously for us, there's two, um, there's two, two, two main points, but it's all part of this larger um, kind of generative AI policy we have, we actually released this to the company that talks about human centricity, right? Um, generative AI is to help us be better, us people be better, right? And people have values, we have ambitions, and we need to make sure that the values and the, and the, that we have as an organization and what we're trying to help our customers with, we're staying true to those with our technology. That's why we talk about human centricity because data, right? Generative AI studies data, it studies the past to understand how to predict the present or future it doesn't understand our ambitions or what our values are as an organization. So we have to overlay that into the execution of these, these new technologies and organizations. So security is critical. When we're implementing uh, this new technology stack, it's around making sure that customers, you know, part of the generative AI story is that your, your large language models, you're, you're studying large amounts of data to inform this generative AI, AI, AI experience. Um, the, you know, obviously that's in the public domain when you start talking about combining these internal data sets inside of organizations with the embeddings of large language models from the public domain, security is paramount. It has to be addressed. So we want to talk about security. 
We also want to make sure that any answer that is provided through a generative AI experience is explainable, transparent, and fair to the outcomes we're trying to achieve out there. So for us, we take this incredibly seriously. Um, we are actually, in my opinion, one of the leaders in the world on this conversation. Um, we are being asked by uh, nations, by uh, heads of states um, to actually engage with help them understand how we're applying this actually uh, throughout very, both internally at SAS and how we're helping our customers do this as well. So yeah. very, very important part of the puzzle. We don't have a lot of time, but we should follow up on the whole knowledge graph since you brought up some of those tops. I want to just jump in quickly. Yeah. The whole idea of neural networks, vector retrieval, all this is cool stuff. And you mentioned knowledge is scattered all over the, all over the enterprise. One of the trends that's coming out of this event from the experts uh, speaking here is that we're moving to a world of walled gardens of data sets. And yeah. you know, you go back 20 years ago, that was a bad word. We don't have everything open and free, but when you're dealing with data, you got pre-existing conditions. You've got data warehouses, you've got old school models, but with neural networks and graphs, it's okay to have maybe a pocket full of data that's, you know, proprietary, interesting words, walled garden, yeah. proprietary data, and that's intellectual property. So yes. you don't want to mix it, but you can integrate yeah. it with other data sets. So we're moving to a world where it's looking more in like, like an AI system where it's okay to have pockets of data distributed, but managed properly. And that's not a bad thing. It's a feature, not a bug some say. So what's your take on this? Because this kind of brings up the notion of how do you organize your knowledge graph or knowledge system? Is it a rewrite? Is it a, is it a, re, is it a new system? Um, education certainly has LMSs, which is an old school thinking, but now you got yeah. graphs. What's your thoughts on this? Well, I think the um, the RAG architectures are, are are really just still early innings. Like I, I think they're 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 great. They work to an extent, but there's a, some scale limitations of certain types of questions you want to answer. I mean, the fundamental thing is the large language models have said, like the LLMs have studied public domain information to provide. Um, you know, human-like responses to this data they have studied, right? And there's inferencing and all that great stuff, but you know, they're, at the fundamental part of it, they're pretty dumb though, right? It's really a probability machine for the next word given the state of the context it was given. The trick is you have to be able to take that um, learnings of that language and map it to the probabilistic models that are inside your organization to do predictive things like forecasting in the quantitative space in your organization. So if you've got, um, you know, transactions for a retail and a store, or if you're looking at telemetry data in a manufacturing plant, or if you're looking at, uh, uh, let's see, uh, maybe a manufacturing defects off the line inside of, uh, uh, like say solar panels, like you're going to be wanting to marry this generative experience, generative experience with kind of pr predictive modeling capabilities that we know of today with this traditional machine learning, which the fact that these are traditional machine learning in the same sentence is hilarious in itself. <laughs> so I think, but the reality is that, that there's going to have to be this wall guard because really the, the, the large language models are bootstrapping the ability to have conversant experiences with software, but all that data is private in the organizations. So really you want the outside, the public domain knowledge to inform one way to the inside of the organization where appropriate and where companies want to feedback out for the greater good, they can do that, but they need to be in control of that, right? They need to know when data should go back out to the organization. So yeah. there is this idea of data sovereignty that keeps coming up, which is that um, it's not that people just want to go and hide it. It's that, that the customer, the, 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 the customer or the organization needs control of when that data is going to be exposed to a shared large language model process or when it needs to be contained and isolated away from a large language model process out there. So that really is the big, uh, in my opinion, architectural uh, pattern that everyone's trying to figure out right now on how to apply large language models into their organization. And so you're you're the school then of models will talk to each other, APIs will be the lingua franca, data is going to be in there. See a lot of SQL, a lot of machine yeah. machine. Oh yeah, yeah. Like yeah, we're not. I mean, we're not going to go and uh, boil the ocean here. I mean, like we, we everyone talked about how we were going to map and reduce the world, and that basically, you know, <laughs> that burned and that died and burned a few years ago, thankfully, right? So I mean, it, we're just not going to do that. It, it, by the time you get done that, you'll have a whole new technology to work with. So I think we got to be pragmatic. We need to be able to say, how do I leverage my existing investments in? Uh, SQL databases, existing data lakes, um, Delta lakes, whatever you're doing, that all has to be integrated in with these conversational generative AI experiences. And that's the architectural, repeatable architectural patterns um, that people are trying to figure out how to scale that. That is really the, 
the, the, the art right now that everyone's working on. That's, that's the state of the art research that everyone's trying to get to. How do I do that in a way that's repeatable across industries in a way that I can allow my, uh, I can have products that can be transparent, explainable, yeah. fair, that you know, they, they ensure that they're trustworthy, but they also can um, speak to the vernacular of that industry. And that's really what SaaS is focusing on. We'll have those architectural conversations. It is early innings, it's evolving real time. Uh, next gen cloud is here. Data, the role of data is changing. You see it in that big time. I think the generative AI has highlighted the fact that it generates stuff, M models will work together. Um, there'll be a few large language models, but there'll be a power law. Uh, all this is to, to be unpacked. We'll continue that. Brian, final minute we have left. Yeah. Um, what's going on at SAS for you right now? What's on your agenda? What's your focus right now for the next uh, year? Well, for us, for me, it is really, we are in the heat of, of implementing generative AI use cases with customers, which has had, they're coming in left and right. I'm meeting with customers left and right on how they want to apply this technology and how we focus it on real game-changing outcomes for the business. Uh, and so it's, it's, and it's really about what I just said, how do we combine their existing uh, investments with SaaS where we're doing modeling for in the banking side of the house for CCAR calculations? How do we bring those calculations into generative AI, AI experiences? I got life sciences companies who are asking the same uh, from their perspective on this. So for us, it's really about how do we make this generative AI thing a real tangible business return where it's a 10 X return for these businesses. You know, the world's experiencing inflation. And as I said before, inflation associated with what's associated with inflation is inefficiency. And really for us, AI, we believe is what takes out those, uh, takes out the inflationary pressures in the market. So we can make, uh, help customers run faster, leaner, and with more efficiently that we can start seeing prices and inflationary pressures coming down in the world. That's what we're trying to do. So you guys as a company, has a lot of data, obviously analytics, data drives organizations. AI is a dream scenario for you guys. Uh, well positioned if that's going to change and give you guys a tailwind, certainly in the business. Other companies, what would you, advice would you give other folks out there who you know, have a data strategy, might not be as immersed into data as you guys are with your mm -hmm. customers. Uh, how should they be thinking about leaning into this wave just quick best practice advice for your peers. Uh, you gotta you, you gotta get your data straight, right? So if you're gonna go and start to use generative AI capabilities or any AI, like you have to have your data uh, strategy understood. It doesn't need to be perfect. You just need to have a strategy and have the discipline to go forward and, and it can take multi years. It's okay. It's not gonna be like you're done your data strategy. It's a consistent, persistent effort in your organization. And those that could honestly pay that um, properly with their efforts and their focus will ultimately win because these AI, these enhanced AI capabilities that uh, that are unlocked when you have a good data strategy are so game changing, game changing to the business yeah. that you want to see that ultimate um, achievement. And that, that starts with data. And so you got to get the data strategy right. That's why, again, data management for us is such a high focus area of uh, value for uh, even when we talk generative AI, data management is right there with it. Brian Harris, EVP, CTO of SAS. Again, I can't agree with you further. It's a perfect storm. If you're involved in data, this is a, a tailwind. Like the pandemic, people could, should learn from. If you were in the cloud and you got in the cloud before the pandemic hit, you rode that well through and came right. out better the other side. Here with AI, still, I'd say not even the first innings, early pregame, it's pregame <laughs> AI. So I think if folks can get in there, that's what we're learning here on the show, get in, with your data fest and not just doing the normal data stuff, make it central so it can scale. Brian, this is your key point. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate All it. All right, John, thank you so much. Hey, Brian Harris, EVP, CTO of SaaS. They're in, they got data. They're, they've been a data company from day one. They've been serving a lot of customers. Now AI is changing the game. This is a competitive advantage if companies can get generative AI right. It'll change how they build applications, software, infrastructure, and how they change the workforce. This is theCUBE's live coverage here. We are in Palo Alto for in-studio SuperCloud 4 event. We'll be right back with more after this short break.